you've built a rapport with Goldman Sachs, a couple of the managing directors, or uh, JP Morgan, or ING, and then that relationship stays. You've done deals, you know, and so uh, they uh, can over, uh, many times override the uh, general parameters, the lending parameters. But uh, Barclays, Bank of America, these banks that have, you know, thousands and thousands of branches. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it. We had a senior person here uh, years ago from Bank of America, and at that time, this was maybe 10 years ago, how many phone calls do you think, um, did I say this already? How many phone calls does a branch manager get? No, I didn't. How many phone calls do you think a branch manager of an average branch bank in the United States gets a year? Seven, no, a year. 25,000. Who do you think they answer? This, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You call 120 times, you're going to get an answer. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So the poor branch manager, he's making uh, roughly, uh, that's 2,000 calls a month, that's 5,000 calls a week, 500 calls a week, excuse me. What? I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a, lot of, a lot of calls, especially when they're running around trying to take care of business and make, and, and now, you know, and, and, and I realize I get different banking treatment because of who I supposedly am, um, and uh, the, uh, but the banks send the managers here to sign papers. I don't go there. I, mean, I sign papers there. It was a question. 900K, can you get that from the local branch? Or? Yeah. yeah. Now, if it's, if it's a local branch in, um, name a little city in Portugal. Well, uh, Portugal is usually, usually difficult, like even in the big city. Like, a lot. Okay, well, I mean, uh, this, this was a, uh, yeah, this, this was a, a, a branch in, um, Near Santa Barbara, California. Santa Barbara, which is about a million people, but I mean, it's not a big city. I mean, it's kind of like San Diego. Um, that that banker doesn't like you. It's hard to believe you're such a sweetheart. To be, to be honest, though, so, so again, I have to be volunteer. I'm just being just doing my own thing. I don't have a bullet. It's just it's just me saying, hey, I found this air conditioning business. I like to buy it. Uh, what do you think? And then she told me that. So um, I, I should put together the bullet. I mean, the, it's, it makes life a lot easier. But this is, um, this is uh, more or less, uh, if he had asked for the loan, then a working capital loan, then a line of credit, the working capital loan would have probably been the same size as the Co-America, and he would have covered it that way. And then, if Co-America gave, gave him the line of credit, then he could have used that to pay off accountants, the lawyers, and take money out. On this deal, he didn't take any money out because it was, I mean, just a few, I mean, little, I think, I, what is it, 35 or 50 grand overfinanced? I mean, that's not enough money to pay anybody. It wasn't enough to pay the uh, accountants and lawyers. Um, and what was the collateral for the loan? The business. The business. And uh, the, the, no assets. No assets. Uh, I mean, filing cabinets. Computers, they don't have typewriters anymore, but I mean, filing cabinets, computers, no cars, no trucks, no nothing. I mean, money is at a 5,000 year low, interest rates. They can't get money out the goddamn door quick enough. Out the door. And um, the, um, and it's, you know, it's a no brainer. Uh, of course, the question I asked to him, what if Co-America didn't come forward? And he said, I would have been fucked. <laughs> you know, he didn't dance around it. And he says, I should have done this. And, this, and then, then in the next slide, I say, or he says to me, because he put this in his weekly report, and I comment, and uh, the, uh, I'm happy on the one hand that he got it done, but then I say, and this is how I put shit in your weekly report. What did you learn from this 200K that Co-America put in? And he said, I should to play the banks like you taught. And he didn't do. He didn't put that part of the sentence down. Because if he had done it correctly and he followed the template to the letter, he would have had the working capital from the initial bank. And he didn't ask the seller for 100% seller finance. 
he allowed the seller to dictate how much of uh, a note he was going to leave. But it's, it's, it's no uh, rocket scientist, yeah. But he's got two years. Two, oh, yeah. Now that part, two years, no payments is a thing of beauty. So when, when he tells a story, he emphasizes that. So, but like if he, is it okay to not have 100% sales finance if there's, let's say, wiggle room of like a year or two years, a year and a half? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, it, it, it makes up for a lot of uh, evil having not to make a payment for two years. I mean, that's pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. Now, I, you know, if he said, that, and that was the seller's idea, no payment for two years. If the seller says that, I would have pushed him, oh, well then, I mean, the cash flow, current cash flow is not important to you. Well, how about five years? So if he said that, then I would have, you know, you know, the, uh, so you, no matter what they say, when it's their idea, then you push them. If you have to introduce the seller's finance um, or the payments, etc., then it's, it's a harder sled. It's a harder sled. It's like in Chris Ballard's deal from a few days ago. He asked her what she needs, and she said she needed, and so then he made the payment schedule based on what her needs were. It's the same thing with somebody's hand. Yes. So if Car America didn't actually put up the 200000 he could just go back to the seller and get them to put up the rest of the money? Well, he could, but Car America did put up. It's only Singh they won't fund. Uh, you, know, you didn't tell them about your kids, did you? <laughs> oh, it's not, you know, the... Um, we switched from Sugar Ray. I, I started calling you something else. Sugar Ray and... Uh, I gave you another name. Sure. Yeah. You give me plain names. No, no, seeing no, you you were Sugar Ray, and then I, I changed it. What did I say? Oh, Oh, yeah. No, well, no, no, okay. Um, but um, this is this is a pretty typical deal. He got lucky with the two hundred, but I would have gone back if the two hundred didn't come up uh, from the second bank. I would have gone back and pushed back on the depending on are they in a hurry. As much of a hurry you're in, guys, the seller's in a bigger hurry. Because contrary to what they told you, remember one of the questions in your temp template, how long have you been on the market? How long has this been up for market? And some of the businesses you're going to see have been on the market three, four, five, six years. And, if, and, and if, depending on your computer capability, and you go back and you see that it was at, they were asking seven million five years ago, and now they're asking 3.6 million. So there's a reason it didn't sell at 7 million. And you're probably not the first one that's interested at 3.7 million. But these are questions you have to ask. And if you don't get answers, then next. Next. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah, did he, uh did he vet the bank before he, he proceeded with this deal to make sure he had enough capital coming to? Not properly. I know you're going to make a note of this. You know that he's going to, the, the Canadian's going to vet the shit out of the bank. And I mean, he's going to leave no T uncrossed, no dot undotted, or no I undotted. I mean, if you, if you ask all the questions, then you're not left like this. But then you get so excited, like the first time, you know, you get so excited you want, it, you want it to close. And some of the kids get so excited they don't even add it. I add up to see if they got enough fucking money. And of course, and, and the lawyers and accountants are professionals. They don't tell you there's not enough money for us to get paid. 99% of the time, they're not going to say how, you know, they may think, how are we going to get paid? There's no money in this thing. But they're... Professional.
Now, if I was a lawyer, I kind of say, hey, we can't do this deal. How are you going to pay me? <laughs> but I'm not a professional. So, I mean, uh, but, you know, an accountant and a lawyer, I'd be worried. Closing the, but he was on a delayed. They were on a delayed. So, I mean, but if this was a straight up deal, not delayed fees, you know, the, the, the accountants and lawyers would be dragging their feet. You know, uh, closing up a deal, we're not going to get paid. They got time for somebody else more than they got time for you. I've never in, since I discovered delayed fees in 1981, I've never had a deal, never, ever, ever had a deal not close because the lawyer and or accountant killed it. Never on a delayed fee basis. I never had a deal not close. I'm not saying they did anything unprofessional. I'm not doing anything, uh, saying they did anything wrong, bad. But coincidentally, I've never had a deal not close when the lawyers and accountants weren't going to get paid. I like to believe they, they figured out a creative way to get it closed. But you can talk to a lot of M&A guys and at least half of them are going to say, ah, fucking lawyers killed that deal and the accountants killed that deal. And Great Western, an option taken public. There's no, re there's no way that deal should have closed. None. Zero. Except the kids that worked on it wouldn't have gotten paid. So I made history riding on the skis of delayed fees. Yes, ma'am. It's working capital. Is it like constant or is it limited in time? No, no, no. Working capital is any time. But it's one of the least asked for parts of a transaction. Remember, the cost of the deal, purchase price, working capital, overdraft. And uh, the overdraft is, you know, what if this happens, or line of credit, as it's called in some parts of the world. Um, but I mean, it's difficult to find a financial institution that doesn't understand you're gonna need working capital. Uh, some of the difficulty is when you hit, hit them with a third part of the salami technique, well, they're gonna think, well, Pena knew that he needed, you know, why didn't he ask this for before? But you're going to be there, and you're naive. You don't know any better. You know, you read a book by, you know, uh, Joe Jones, uh, you know, and it says, uh, you know, first you pay for the deal, then you get working capital, then you get line of credit. So you, I mean, yeah, it, it's a normal part of a transaction. It's a normal, yes, sir. And you asked this all in the same day. Uh well, no, no, remember, you drop one shoe. Now, I know you, we don't have three feet, but you drop the first shoe is the deal, okay? The second shoe is working capital. And then, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, I'm married. You know how when you, you, you're leaving the motel? Oh, by the way, at breakfast, oh, by, uh, you put your wedding ring back on. Oh, <laughs> you know, oh, by the way, I'm married. That's the third shoe. I can tell that we don't have any, many uh, YouTube. Uh, this is all just uh, metaphorically speaking, of course, that uh, we don't have the, even though they giggle, I don't think we had anybody that ever said at breakfast oh, as they put their wedding band back on. Do guys still take their wedding band off when they're all doing bad things? Yeah, we don't wear them. Oh, you don't wear them. Okay, well, I, I, I don't wear a wedding band, but the, uh, yeah, that, but the tie-in line down in certain Texas and shit like that, I mean, you might as well paint on your finger. I mean, uh, what's that tan line, you know? Um, well, maybe there is hope for the human race. Uh, maybe I shouldn't give up totally. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't give up totally. But, um, oh, is this, I bet you you said, oh, by the way, I'm married. I'm not. <laughs> no, you've never been married. Never been married. Okay. I'm not that stupid. I mean, look like, like <laughs> Okay, what's the question? So I have a QLA question. What, uh, what would you recommend or what could you uh, advise me to take into consideration given the fact that, that I'm a... By getting married? Don't. No, 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 no. I can say that easy. I can cut you short right quick. Okay, go ahead. So I'm going to fly back home on Monday and I'm going to call on companies. And where are you going home? So I'm going to call on companies in the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, and one thing to... Well, you know Belgium are a little soft because you, we've got our... You know, Belgium waffle here. So uh, you're going to go, uh, you know. So uh, for eyeball to eyeball meetings, I'm going to fly in every two to three weeks. 
Um, from there back to Belgium? Yeah, until the, or the Netherlands, until the first deal. Okay, arises. I'm listening. So what should I take into consideration given that situation? Well, I mean, uh, by the way, people, uh, if you, uh, one of the books I recommend, uh, the, if you have to read something, is Winning Through Intimidation by Ringer. The first edition, there's six editions. The first edition, Winning Through Intimidation by Ringer. No, no, R-I-N-G-E-R. -E uh, and uh, Winning Through Intimidation, it came out in the 70s. And he had a theory which I lived by. Travel more than 200 miles with a briefcase, you're an expert. You travel more than two, and if you travel 2,000 miles, you're uh, an extraordinary expert. Okay? Uh, the, uh, and always make sure they know you've traveled. One, it's easier to set up meetings. Okay? I'm going to be in town between such and such and such and such. Okay? Uh, and uh, make, it, make it known. Uh, and um, what area are you going to go into? Uh, medical. Okay. Does that mean healthcare? Healthcare, yes. Okay. Bedpans. Okay. Fine. Okay. Um, the um, you know you're going to set up. You know you're going to get somebody from LinkedIn, uh, and you're going to do the board and all that stuff. Uh, and you're going to you're going to meet eyeball to eyeball. And it's easier. One of the things that it is easier when you're traveling that distance to set up meetings for your uh, dream team. Because they will, especially in the 21st century, I mean, they're very accommodating when you're traveling. If you're going from uh, Dallas to, to, uh, to Houston, they're not, okay? Uh, you'll fit in their schedule, uh, in their uh, timeline. But when you're traveling, you know, a few hundred or a few thousand miles, uh, I, uh, you know, you virtually won't get turned down for, for, for eyeball to eyeball meetings. You won't. Uh, but do as many meetings as you can. Okay, uh, the, um, you know, I used to do, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight meetings a day. Uh, the, uh, but if you do, you know, two, three, four meetings a day, uh, meet, uh, give them a doofus test, having them meet you on Friday afternoons, Friday uh, early evenings, have them meet you because you're traveling, you got, you know, I, I'm going to be here till Monday, so I want to see people over the weekend. Okay. And you, you'll get away with it. Well, first of all, it's true because you're going to, you know, uh, but you'll get away with, uh, they'll give you more uh, um, latitude because you're traveling and take advantage of it. Not in an unprofessional way, but you, you know, you want to see as many people as you, as you can. Um, and um, the, um, and some of the guys and gals have been more successful building their dream teams and executing because they traveled. They traveled. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, normally the wrong reason, they give you the benefit of the doubt. They also think that, you know, that uh, the deal might be a better deal because you're coming from someplace else. There used to be a saying in Texas, if an oil deal left Texas, it was dog shit. If an oil deal even had to go from Texas to Oklahoma, it was dog shit. If an oil deal had to go from Texas to New York, forget about it. Only the morons were putting money up. Uh, if, 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 if an oil deal left central Dallas, it was no good. Okay. Because the guys that have money that have to know what they're doing, aren't going to let it, some Yankee, which they still call them in the North Yankees there, some Yankee invest uh, in, in a deal. So I would, you know, hit the ground running and, um, um, and in times of the essence, kids, Time is of the essence. Now, you all have, uh, except um, Belgium Waffle doesn't have her thing yet, right? You haven't gone back to your room? Did you get your... I have the USB. You have it? Yeah. Okay. So everybody has it. Now, is it in the room? No. Yeah, they're in the rooms. In your bed. They're in the rooms. With the books? We just go check the room. Okay. Well, okay. Well, okay. Well, so, yeah, maybe somebody else stole them all, you know? Uh, the, um, and you've got all the stuff, copy it, put it on your whatever. I'm just telling you, copy it as soon as you can. Um, any other questions? Okay. Uh, who's my 530? And it's, we're going to be earlier than 530 because we're ending early. I don't, I, I only have you today, I believe. And then tomorrow I have the, uh, oh fuck. I can't hardly wait. <laughs>
Uh, haven't I already talked to you? <laughs> um, okay, any, 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 any final questions? I want you to go out there and rip their head off and shit down their necks. I mean, and remember, uh, it's hard when you get their head off, you got to have strong thighs to keep their shoulders upright, and then you got to lean back to take a dump on them. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Rob, make me proud. Make me proud. <laughs>